Well, I want to welcome everybody here tonight. My name is Joel Kershaw. I'm president of the CSI Singles Chapter this year. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, into the session tonight. Uh, this is one that we're starting up our uh, live sessions again. A uh, little bit of a hybrid here. We have some online and some live here. Uh, we do have a, a nice group here. And I think we have a nice presentation tonight. Uh, I did want to recognize one of our, uh, actually is one of our speakers tonight. Mr. Steve Gantner uh, was awarded the uh, SKIP 2021 Education Award this year. So that's, you know, and so this is an uh, award that's not even given every year. So congratulations, Steve. Good job. Uh, at this time, I think I'm ready to introduce uh, George Everday. George, in addition to having his name on the board as a presenter tonight, is also on our program committee. Um, tonight's program on construction failure, just to give you a little background, is something that I've been kicking around in my head for quite a few years ago. And I submitted it for construct the CSI National Convention for 2020. Um, Obviously, that convention didn't happen. And in the program committee, we were talking about um, would this be a good topic after COVID? Are people tired of looking at problems and failures and sort of bad things? The more we talked about it, the more we felt that because of what we saw in our response to COVID, it might be worthwhile to look at construction failure. Those of you who chose not to come, and we certainly understand why you might not want to be here, but I got to tell you, you're missing some great food. Uh, <laughs> today's sponsor, Paula, really uh, did a great job for us, and we're, we're well fed before we start. Um, Stephen Gold is our local rep, and George Ramsey, who is out of Minneapolis, uh, came down to join us. And George, we're going to make you say a few words, or ask you to say a few words on behalf of Paula. Thanks, George. Uh, it's always a pleasure to join the St. Louis group. I'm based out of Minneapolis. I'm serving on the uh, Northern Chapter for the Treasury Committee for Region. And, uh, you know, I'm a big supporter of CSI, and it's great to see everybody and always willing to help and participate. So thank you. And thanks to Steve. Steve Bowles, the St. Louis Chapter, put everything in. So thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. George. <laughs> Today I'll be talking a bit uh, in introduction not only to what's happening today, but also what we're going to be doing for the rest of, of the year. Michael Bird will uh, discuss a very interesting project that was a failure and uh, actually injured and killed the adult. And then uh, Steve Gander will be talking about his experiences with the 2011 Joplin tornado. Uh, unfortunately, that was... Uh, much more fatal. Yeah, much more different. That's the outline of what we're going to be doing. Trial and error, as Calvin and his dad are discussing here, has been a means of problem solving for a long time. Uh, Calvin and mom and dad are riding across the bridge with a sign that says load limit 10 tons. And Calvin asks, how do they know the load limit on bridges, dad? And dad, of course, being a dad, uh, has the right answer. They drive bigger and bigger trucks over the bridge until it breaks. Then they weigh the last truck and they rebuild the bridge. I thought this was appropriate for <clears throat> what we're talking about here because um, a lot of what we do in this business historically has been trial and, and error, and I think it still is um, very much part of what, what we do. The focus is not so much on the failure. We're going to need to talk about some tough stuff. And I have to tell you that in doing the research for the program that I was going to put together, it was really difficult. Um, there are a lot of things that could have been talked about tonight. Neil deGrasse Tyson has a wonderful little, very short 15 second YouTube where he's getting ready to speak and they're doing like, you know, the sound check. And they asked him to say anything. And what he said was, the universe is a deadly place. At every opportunity, it is trying to kill us. And for people in construction, or 
Earth is not exactly friendly. Gravity is not our friend. Particularly as we get older, gravity is not our friend. Hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, wildfires. We have to deal with that in everything that we build. And what about human stupidity? Or human hubris? Or human just lack of basic knowledge? Not necessarily making mistakes, but just not understanding the right questions. One definition of failure, and see if you all like this, the building our component loses its ability to perform its intended design function. A catastrophe, and uh, this is actually uh, from the U.S. Code, a catastrophe is, designed, is defined as a natural or man-made disaster with extraordinary level of casualties or damage. I think we can all uh, agree with that. There's probably a number of other ways we can define that, but now NASA defines a catastrophic failure as sudden and total failure from which recovery is impossible. Think of the space shuttles, right? The interesting thing is that these last two are in a little bit of a conflict. You can have a catastrophic failure without a loss of life. If the entire system is, is damaged to such a point that it cannot be used, that's a catastrophic failure. So um, here are some four different areas of, of failure. Structural failure, many of the ones we talked about were structural. A performance failure, our product reps, that's kind of what you, you deal with. Uh, aesthetic failure is, is the paint fading, right? And a financial failure. And the fi financial failure uh, is, is sometimes as a result of the other types of failure. Sometimes it's separate from it. You can have a structural success, a performance success, and a setting success and still have a failure. And the other thing is you don't have to be in one of these areas. You can be in many of them as we, we go through, right? The cause of the failure. Proximate cause. Think of proximity. It's the direct cause. It's what happens immediately before the failure that results in the failure. And if the proximate cause isn't there, you don't have a failure. Root causes are underlying causes. There are generally multiple root causes in a failure. They contribute to the proximate cause. So to give an example of this, I think you, you mentioned the Hyatt, right? The Hyatt Regency. The proximate cause is a weld failed, allowing a supporting rod to pull through a box beam, causing the walkways to fall. If that hadn't happened, if it had survived the, the tea dance with people jumping up and down, there wouldn't have been a failure. Now, it may have happened the next week, right? But that's why it's a proximate failure. That's what actually caused the problem. But the root causes are that the design was structurally incorrect for a couple of reasons. One, the dance party was a much higher load than anyone anticipated. And two, the design of the connection was changed, and it was changed because the design of the support was difficult or impossible to build. Um, Steve and I were talking before, uh, and he mentioned that in Joplin, the proximate cause is what? The tornado, right? The root causes of the damage were the fact maybe that the, the silk plate wasn't anchored to the foundation or the the roof structure wasn't, uh, you know, anchored to the, to the wall. The important thing to keep in mind is that the reason you want to go to the root causes is you can identify the underlying problems. And all of us, whether we're an architect or a product rep or a contractor, in our organization and in our process of doing things, we want that to be correct and we want that to be such that we can avoid the problems that cause failure. 
classify failure. Human error and natural causes are both. And I'm not claiming this is a comprehensive list, but I think it's probably pretty good. I'm going to use these as we go through with each of the uh, examples that they talk about and try to identify where um, these, these failures uh, occur. The interesting thing, as far as economic failure goes, um, economic failure is, is sometimes totally apart from what we as architects and contractors uh, and even building owners do. Sometimes the economic failure is just the economy goes bad. And the building that we're building doesn't work. Those of you that ever had my talk about the East Bridge, uh, we love the East Bridge. Wonderful thing for St. Louis. The East Bridge was built, and within five years, it was an economic failure. So, who's to blame? Let's point some fingers. Me. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that often happens, right? Is that we get to, to deal with the failure, and we start pointing fingers. And um, the blame can be just because we like grooving it this way in any of the three major parties, design, construction, or owner development, right? But sometimes we get to the point we say it's nobody's fault. It just happened. This is something that actually I didn't learn about uh, in any depth until I got involved with the door hardware industry. The Iroquois Theater in Chicago had a horrible fire on December 30th in 1903. And they had just opened this Mr. Bluebeard uh, play. Here's a copy of the play, Playbill. And you probably can't see on the screen, but in the upper uh, corner, absolutely fireproof. The theater was advertised as the, the biggest innovation in theaters in, in Chicago. It was the show place and palace. The proximate cause, Sparks from a stage light ignited the stage curtain. And the building burned, you can see the results of it. Uh, one of the, the reasons that the first couple of tragedies I'm talking about so resonated with people was that newspapers were a big thing. And they were competing, and there were a lot of published photographs of the results of bodies, burned bodies, and so, so forth. Um, I'm not going to show them. If you have a, an interest in that sort of thing, you can find them on, online. But it was just horrible, just horrible. 250 people were injured, 600 uh, killed. The root causes. The theater opened with no operating sprinklers. There were not enough exits. It was over capacity. People were sitting in the aisles. Capacity 1,600. And there were possibly as many as 2,200 people in the house. Stairways were blocked with iron gates. There was one interior stairway to get to the balcony, and there was a price difference from the main floor to the balcony, so they had that gate up with people going back and forth. Exit doors opened inward, which was not against code at that time. Uh, many exits were concealed by drapes. The exterior doors were locked from the inside. And there are indications of questionable code activity of the owner making deals with uh, the code people to get it open in time. And sadly, I'm only listing maybe two-thirds of the root causes. This is a horrible event. Exit devices were invented as a result of this fire. How many lives have been saved by panic bombs, by exit devices? since this happened. And these came into effect almost immediately afterwards. Codes were changed so the exterior doors had to open up. To those of us in the industry, that's a no-brainer, right? We all understand that. Back then, it wasn't. And um, in terms of operation, in terms of management, cities prohibited the standing in the environment. Standards. So you can see that our world today is vastly different and vastly safer as a result of what happened as a result of the, uh, of the theater fire, the airport theater fire. And we'll go to another one. 
this may be more famous. Who is, uh, who's never heard of the triangle shirtwaist fabric? Well, uh, let's define what a shirtwaist is. In uh, the early 1900s, uh, women would wear an overgarment when they worked that would keep their, their dresses clean, right? Uh, so it was sort of like a vest. And this was a real popular thing in the, in the 1900s, 19-teens. This is a sweatshop. 146 people died in this fire. And they were mostly immigrant women. And there were a lot of girls, some as young as 14. You can see a kind of a nice picture of the work uh, environment here. Yeah, picture that with the conditions when the fire broke out. These women are working on a piece work basis. They're working as fast as they can. That aisle that you see that's all nice, nicely wooded, with wooden there, that would be covered maybe a foot deep with scraps from people making shirt waves. There was bins full of scraps. The proximate cause, an unextinguished batch or cigarette butt was thrown into a scrap. And you can picture what happened as a result of that. The root causes inadequate maintenance of the workplace. As the doors would chain to keep the women walk, from walking out with the product. There was only one key to the exit. The manager had it. The manager got the hell out of the but There were no audible fire uh, alarms. The exterior fire escape, which they were able to get into, had been damaged prior to the fire and not fixed, and it collapsed. Elevators remained in use in the uh, during, during the fire, a lot of deaths is related to, to that. An interesting fact about this, we talked about the, about the Iroquois fire uh, with some questionable code practices. Cornell University is the sort of owner of documentation on the Triangle Sherwood's fire. And uh, they did a study 10 or 15 years ago and made the case that the ash building where the, this, this factor was completely complied with code as it was written, right? This is an issue not so much of building code as ownership and management. The big deal about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory is it led to labor. It led to better working conditions. It led to training with fire drills and procedures. It led to a prohibition of locked exit doors, if you can believe that, and a re-examination of elevator use during the fire. This fire directly led, 20 years later, or 30 years later, to the institution of the U.S. Department of Labor. The first Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins, who also was the first woman in a cabinet, uh, was on the street with this happened. Her work towards that led to changes in, in labor laws and changes in things. And then uh, Grand Hotel Fire in Las Vegas, 1980. Deaths and injuries in fire don't always come from flame and heat. The first two we talked about, obviously, that was the, the cause of death. 85 people died in this fire. Only four died from flame and uh, heat. Uh, you can see on the, uh, on the photograph of the building uh, and fire there, the, the smoke on the outside of the building is coming from one story wing on the building that was restaurants and delis and that sort of thing. The owner of the casino negotiated with the building department to not put sprinklers in that thing. And the justification was this. This is a casino. It's open 24 hours a day. There's always going to be somebody there. A couple of years after the thing is built, ah, the deli doesn't need to be open. A compressor in the deli caught fire uh, when it was closed, and that uh, started the fire. We had 24 deaths on the first floor. No deaths on floors 2 through 18. And 61 deaths on the 19th to the 25th floor. What happened is that gases and smoke went up through uh, HVAC shafts and the elevators, but more importantly, went through every crack and crevice that wasn't filled. 
back in this era, there was uh, little understanding of penetration fire stopping. That really was the worst part of this, this fire. Um, I mentioned the approximate cause, the, the uh, compressor fault. The root causes, uh, you know, lack of, lack of sprinklers. The elevators did not return automatically to the first floor. No smoke evacuation in, in the stairwells. And flammable finishes were allowed on that first floor portion. So, code. Fire sprinklers are required now. Have you been in a hotel or a motel recently that did not have fire sprinklers? Probably not. I think that would be pretty rare. Um, a re-examination of the smoke uh, evacuation codes. Exit mask, right? <laughs> I, I remember a time when you'd check into a hotel room and this wouldn't be on the, on the door. Now, every hotel in its check-in do has this. But most importantly, this led to the development of through penetration and joint fire stop, which now is second nature to every architect. Flame spread uh, doesn't have to happen only on the inside. Grenfell Tower was essentially a public house. You can see a picture in the upper right there of what it looked like when it was built in the 1960s. Kind of a plain, brutalist concrete building. Um, and then down below that, uh, was how it was modified just a few years before the fire. This investigation is still ongoing, but uh, I think it's pretty clear that the sponsoring area, the, the district that built this house, to all reports, it, it was a, a, a decent uh, project. Uh, people enjoyed li living there. I think what happened was that the neighborhood got gentrified, and they didn't like seeing this rather plain building in the middle of there. So they, they paid to have uh, MCM, um, metal composite material, put on the, on the outside of the building. They also dressed up the inside of the units using plastic trim. They redid the windows. Grandville Tower was an important place concrete box. So when you were in your unit, you had six concrete walls surrounding fire evacuation procedure was in the event of a fire, you stay in your unit, you shelter in place, right? Because the guy next door, could be, his place could be burning up, he leaves, he closes his door, the fire brigade comes in, puts it out, it doesn't spread. What the renovation did was it provided a path from the inside of the unit to this outside non-fire resistant metal composite panel. And um, the fire was started by a compressor of a refrigerator of, by the outside wall. It started to burn up. It went through the plastic trim. It went through non-fire stop gaps in, in the new, new window. Caught the outside of the building on fire and spread up. And of course, every apartment unit had the same condition. It went from the burning MCM on the outside of the building into the inside of the units. So you can see the damage here. Um, 72 dead. The worst residential fire in the UK since World War II. It's looking like the cladding material did not comply with the regulations in place. Uh, Britain has a, a performance-based code, not a prescriptive. Right, our code says everything over 60 feet needs to be fire retardant materials, right? Um, not clear exactly what went on here, but it is clear that every bit of the MCM on the outside of this building was powder and was not fire retardant. So the improvements, you know, since we're still uh, under review, it's hard to say, but uh, NFPA uh, 285, which is a multi story burn test that we all have to do on, on buildings. Um, it's unclear whether stuff like that is used in, in the UK. They're probably going to uh, adopt that. Uh, fire resistant MCM is going to be required. Uh, Steve was telling me that uh, the US manufacturers no, no longer make a, a non uh, fire rate 
Yeah. From what I understand, talking about power prices, most manufacturers have stopped making non fire in Seattle. The, the uh, building is still still standing there. There's questions about what they're going to do with it. There are actually some people who want to restore it and back in because they like living there. You know, restore it obviously to a, a much safer condition. There's uh, ideas of making a monument uh, to the people that died. One was uh, using it as a, as a planted uh, a garden. Uh, and uh, current thinking, I think, among the council there, uh, actually, who's the building is that they're prepared for that. So if this building is torn down, it's a catastrophic failure because the system reached the point where it was no longer usable. It would be a total loss of the building, right? Think back. The Iroquois Theater, not a catastrophic fit. After the fire, they restored the theater, they opened it up again, they had plays there for another 25 years, and then they tore down everything except the front and rebuilt the theater there because it was a great spot and theater, uh, you know, design had uh, gotten to the point where they wanted to make it uh, a more, more modern theater. Triangle Shirtwaist was restored. The actors went in there <coughs> two years later New York University purchased the building and currently exists as offices. Ever since the 1920s, New York University has used and occupied that, that building. And the MGM Grant, 2006, CSI Convention in Las Vegas, Steve. Where, where did you and I stage? That was about right? well, the yeah. MGM. Yeah, at the M MGM Grant. And we thought no, nothing of it. I mean, I, I felt safe. Okay? So um, those first three horrible, horrible losses of, of life really aren't classified as catastrophic failures. They're tragedies, they're terrible failures. But the building itself, you know, sur survived. And that's an interesting new distinction. I'm still trying to wrap my, my head around that sort of definition. Um, failures of the building on top of them. Fatality zero. Injuries possibly two. The John Hancock building, John Hancock, life just When it was built, and as it was being built, there was a storm uh, with 75 mile an hour wind gusts. So 65 panels in this building were sucked out and started flying through downtown Boston. Right? And um, as construction went on, as there would be wind storms, uh, more and more panels fell. And it got to the point that it was such a dangerous condition that they started, first of all, as you can see on the right here, infilling the panels uh, with plywood panels. And ultimately, almost every window in that building was covered with plywood. What Bostonians called it the plywood palace. This happened, I guess, right after I got out of school. And so it was a big deal. And I remember, as you know, many of us do, whenever there's a, a failure, we try to understand it and we can speculate about um, how it happened. Um, the first spe speculation was the glass was being sucked out on the leeward side of the, of the building. And that was disproved. Uh, possibility of a nickel sulfide uh, in inclusion causing spontaneous breakage, that was disproved. And there was also a foundation settlement when the building was built. So there was speculation that that settlement may have caused it. The actual cause of the failure was that the architect was using a rather innovative product for the company. It was one of the first large-scale uses of insulated mirrored glass. Now, you know, re remember that less than 15 years before was the first uh, uh, the first float glass as a, a product. We had pol polished plate in the number 40. So float, float glass itself was relatively new. Insulated glass, it was also relatively and this mirrored surface was a, was a brand new thing. What happened was there was a lead seal around the outside of the insulated glass. And the chromium coating 
was bonded to the red seal. The red seal was so stiff and strong that any sort of stress on glass caused micro cracking at that seal. And it weakened the glass, and when you got wind load on it, it would just explode and pull out and fly across the streets of Boston. All the insulated glass ultimately was replaced with single pane tempered glass. They went back to a more tried and true te technology. 10,344 windows, $7 million later. John Hancock is in all its glory, right? Uh, the improvements, incredible improvement in the technology of laser, right? And I think our, our modern laser systems really started with this, with this building. The fact that we can tweak glass with, with uh, heat transmission, light transmission, and all the stuff we can do to deal with it, I think it started with understanding this. And then obviously uh, the improved design of the spacers, where they, where they really, really work at. Chicago. This architect was a neoclassicist. So when this building was built in the 1960s, 1970s, at that time it was the tallest building in Chicago. His vision was to use Carrara marble. Now Carrara marble is Michelangelo's Pietà, Michelangelo's David, the Pantheon. This is this is very very white, very very beautiful stuff has lasted for, for years in many important works of art and buildings. The image was that standard oil would uh, present itself with this white, shining, sort of neoclassic tower. At this time, um, new technologies in stonework allowed the panels, which were uh, approximately four by four feet, allowed them to be sawn into one and a quarter inch thick sheets, as opposed to typically you do maybe a two and a half or, or three, three inch slab. Um, so the, the building was built, everybody loved it, you know, the standard oil loved it, and uh, the panel fell a few years after, afterwards. Um, the problem was that Carrera Marble is prone to thermal hysteresis. Thermal hysteresis is an expansion and contraction of the marble over time. It changes the cells of that marble to where it performs. Well, in you know, Rome, rather temperate climate, Chicago, not so much. Right? So 15, 20 years of freeze thaw to form this marble. You can see it marble being, being tested here. It warped. And as it warped, um, the architects would be familiar with the way we, we mount um, marble on a building like that. You cut a curve, which is basically a slot, in the bottom and the top of the panel. And you have a folded plate or you have an angle that goes up to that curve and it holds it in place. Right? Well, now you've got a piece of marble that has maybe a quarter inch curve in it. It's only one and a quarter thick. You've got a half inch on, on either side. That's difficult. That probably workable. But then you get a panel that's deformed and it's starting to break off. Here. The standard oil of credit, when it first started happening, they paid for an extensive investigation of the outside of the building. And that gave them a baseline five years afterwards. And as these panels started to deform worse and worse, they would periodically come in. And check the outside of the building and, and check it against uh, panels that were staying in, in, in the attic stock. And they finally decided that you know every panel on that building was in danger of possibly coming off. So they went back and they used stainless steel straps up and down, drilled into the anchoring system. And the building was covered with, with as many uh, straps as were panels. They painted them white, so it didn't look really, really ugly, but that was a temporary fix. That was to keep, you know, if you thought glass flying around Boston was bad, uh, marble panels flying around uh, Chicago would have been horrible. Um, ultimately, a decision was made. They took every piece of marble off the building and replaced it with granite to 
thicker granite. It's a stronger uh, stone. It's not uh, from the thermal his history since <clears throat> 86, I'm sorry, 80,000 uh, panels were replaced, $80 million. Improvements, a better understanding of the sod materials, a better understanding of stone came out of this. But maybe most importantly, the lesson learned was when you start to have problems like this, and this was a long term problem, this happened over 15 for 20, 20 years. <clears throat> when you start to have problems like this, get them studied. Get someone that knows what they're they're looking about. This was uh, Liz Jenny Elstrick who did, did the work here. Look at a baseline study and then you know compare. And that's exactly what, what the what Stan, standard oil did and that uh, it resulted in zero fatalities, zero injuries. Staying on the exterior, death ray architecture. <laughs> Um, not mentioning the names of the famous architects, and they are famous. The first one is the Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. I'll leave you to guess who the architect was. Essentially, I the drawing there shows the concept of what's happening. When you have a curve like this, rays of the sun can hit it and focus, and that's what happened here. The Concert Hall was, was focusing at certain times of the day across the street. People were actually getting burned by it. Um, the Madera Hotel in Las Vegas uh, is the next one. And uh, this was focusing rays on the pool deck. So Vegas is not a particularly uh, wild climate anyway, but uh, people were getting third degree burns. Well, um, the answer to solve that was to put more umbrellas on the pool deck, which is a great architectural solution, right? The answer in the in the Walt, Walt Disney uh, building was uh, they sandblasted the offending panels. The um, the building in, in London, the third one, 20 Fenton Street, it's called the Walkie Talkie Building, was focusing rays and melting the plastic on Jaguar park across the street. I, it pains me to think that Jaguar would be a plastic trend, but does. The interesting thing is the star architect who did the, the Gara Hotel with the Umbrellas is the same architect who did this building in London five years later. His comment when they asked him why he designed a building like this was, well, I've been to London many times. London is cloudy and rainy. Who knew the sun would come out like this? And um, we went on with it and that being for a while. And then he says, you know, maybe it's global warm. Not to criticize star architects, but that building was corrected by putting a sunshine, a, a sunshade system on the on the curtain wall. And then we'll go on to another uh, unnamed architect who designed a museum in New York City, a notable piece of architecture. It was turning 50 years old, and the exterior is great. Uh, this is a great on concrete system, and it's painted on the outside. The first thing that had to be done was they had to remove 17 layers of paint to get down to the concrete. And then they did a laser survey of all, all the cracks. And this is really bad. I mean, these are, there's some micro cracks here, and there's some pretty bad cracks. Architects, the rule of thumb was expansion joints concrete every 30 feet, right? I mean, that was a rule of thumb that seemed to Let's look at where the big fat cracks are, right? I mean, that's, that's uh, God saying, this is where you should have put your, your uh, joints, you know, Mr. Mr. Architect. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll get off of the slide basically uh, by quoting it at Block, who uh, was a big deal at the Mixer Institute. Ed used to teach a spec class, and he'd say, you know, young architects, you don't need to put expansion joints in your building. You don't need to do it. But if you don't do it, your mother and father will take care of it. Mother Nature and Father Time. That's what's happening here. Uh, the fix on this was um, carbon fiber strips, and you can see some going on uh, on the inside of the building here to help stabilize some of the movement in the concrete. And those strips were also put on the expansion joints that were added. There was an elastomer coating that was put over it that had much more moving capability. 
and the new behind is hoping that it's going to look uh, just as beautiful for the next 50 years. Okay. This notable building, uh, which we all know and love, right, began to lean in the 12th century as it was being built, and the cause of the lean was soft crap. Construction was halted for 100 years as there were wars. Uh, Pisa was fighting other city states. Nothing went on. And this probably saved the tower because while nothing was being done, part of the tower that was already built settled. And it's the same ones. And then they built the rest of the tower. By 1990, this tilt had reached 5.5 degrees. And there was concern that it actually would fall. So you can see the fix. They, they piled lead weights on the back side of the tower. At any rate, that helped to, helped to stabilize it. I guess the question here is, who's to blame? Can we blame the designer? Contractor, owner, developer, this happened a long time ago. And did they have the, the knowledge to understand? I'm saying that this was obviously a structural failure and a performance failure. Is it an aesthetic failure? Years ago, at the beginning of the internet, I used to uh, do homework help for students who were interested in architecture and building and stuff. One of the students in the chat room asked, What would happen if the Lincoln Tower was a bell? My response was they would build it back. There's a reason that I knew that is because uh, my wife and I had been just back from Italy at that time, and we were in Venice. Our first morning at, at the at the B and B, we're having breakfast and we're talking, and, and it was just a wonderful time. And I noticed that Ari is looking like not at me, but looking over my shoulder. I think it's this weird look on her face, and she said. Is that the bell tower falling? Well, this photograph was on the wall behind us. And in fact, you did it best. The bell tower that we're seeing is a reconstruction from the tower that fell in 1902. Um, the tower itself, the one that fell, dates back to the, 12th, uh, to the 9th century. And it had been added on to over time. There were lightning strikes, earthquakes, fires, all sorts of things. And by 1880, uh, there were stalls, vendor stalls uh, around the outside. They decided to get rid of them. And they found that the base was in really bad shape. And rather than do an extensive repair, they sort of patched it up. Well, um, 1902, uh, they were repairing a girder that supported the roof. They cut it out, and as they were pounding the new beam back in, the tower started to shake. And it shook and shook and shook over a period of a few days. Uh, July 14th, martyrs started to fall. In the morning, uh, 9.30, the square was completely evacuated, and 23 minutes later, the tower collapsed. Uh, since they knew it was going to happen, there were a lot of photographs. And I am speculating that this may be the first building collapse actually uh, captured on, on film. So talk about, you know, what happens if the Winning Tower fell. Money was allocated by the city of Venice the next day. There was no question um, what would happen. So um, that raises the question of how do we decide to save the building? The MGM Grand, it's on the strip. A lot of money to do. Grenfell Tower, not, not so much. Grenfell Tower is probably not as damaged as, you know, the, the other buildings. If the leading tower ever falls, the economic loss would be considerable. Tourist trade, you know, drives us. Okay, since we're talking about foundation failures, Millennium Tower. And again, this is still under, under study. A decision was made, an economic decision was made by the de developers not to run the, uh, the piles all the way down to bedrock. And um, as you've heard, no, no doubt we heard that the tower uh, 
10 years after it was built, it sunk 18 inches and tilted 4 feet inches at the top. The fix, since this is in a very expensive area of San Francisco, the fix was to uh, pour a, uh, a beam under the foundation, you can see the detail there, and drive piles or just outside the building all the way to bedrock. That work started, I think, in the summer, and after a few months, they had to stop it because it was just making the tower sink more. So this is still being studied. This is an expensive neighborhood, an expensive building, and an expensive town. And I guess our question is, with this failure, what's going to happen? Are they going to continue to try to save it? Um, Michael Bird's going to be talking uh, after I finally shut up here about uh, about a building that actually uh, was faced with that question. This is something that probably no one in this room has heard, heard about. The Algo Mall collapse in Lake Lake. This was a, a mining uh, rich small town. In 1980, they built a mall, hotel, government office, library, health center, underground parking, and rooftop parking all in one, one building. This was truly the community center. This wasn't just a place to go shop. This was truly the community center. In 2012, a car ran over a joint and a bay of the parking deck collapsed into the mall below, and two women were killed. A decision was made early in the construction to go with an innovative waterproof system that had just come out. And the theory of, of this system was that it wouldn't put a waterproofing membrane over the entire structural site. They would rely on the imperviousness of concrete and only seal and put membrane over the joints. Not a good decision, right? You can kind of see in, in this deep detail here all the different joints. And anyone who's ever had a roof leak knows that where the water comes in, it's probably not directly over where the water goes out. Uh, as the economics of the mall went down, see there was no, no maintenance. They were using buckets to catch water in the library, and ultimately uh, they had this tragedy. The mall had lost economic vi viability. So I think that economics probably enters into this as much as anything economic drove the lack of maintenance. Ultimately, this building was torn, torn down. They're, they're looking at what to do with the site. The good things that happened, the province uh, started minimum maintenance standards for buildings with periodic <coughs> inspections. Continuing education for engineers in Ontario was started. I can't believe that they didn't have it before this. Similar waterproofing systems, unsurprisingly, are ne not used anymore. And advanced non-destructive techniques for measuring rebar corrosion are being developed. And this picture in the upper corner is from this project, but it could have been the one down in Florida. But the condo collapse in Florida, you know, indications are that a dead level structural slab that wasn't properly waterproofed cause of corrosion. And we'll end with this long hands plaza in Bridgeport. This slab, the concept is you pour your your base slab and then you pay uh, you pour three slabs on top of there and then jack them up into place uh, around the columns. And it was a very successful, very safe method of construction. It was used extensively in the 70s and, and 80s. There was a horrible failure here. And uh, you can see in the, the drawing, they got up to the sixth level, and uh, there was a collapse. 28 workers were killed in a horrible manner. You can see a composite of the photographs taken the day, the day after what, a, what a mess this was. The important thing about this failure is the litigation that took place or didn't take place. This happened in 1987. Uh, immediately, a federal two-judge panel put together a settlement. 
there were 100 people, uh, 100 parties uh, involved. 40 of them were contractors, uh, architects, and so forth. Uh, and what the judges did was they basically brought everyone in, everyone who was remotely connected. I had this conversation with Steve, and he was shocked, just like I was when I first heard, heard this. You know, the contractor was brought in, uh, the, the concrete guy, the, you know, this and that. But they also brought in the drywall group, who had just signed his contract the day before and had no materials inside. They brought on the guy that drove the little silver truck that brought donuts. And they basically said, you have a choice. You can either join our pool and make a contribution to a settlement or you could be off on, on your own with danger of being sued. And there were three tiers. I mean, obviously the contractors were at the top tier. Their uh, insurance company kicked in the most of the, the guy with the, the food truck probably didn't have to contribute an awful lot. But uh, uh, the ultimate decision raised uh, $41 million. And that money was distributed to the victims within 18 months of the claims. So, you know, the widows and the children and so forth, their lives, at least economically, went Nobody went out of business. If, if this settlement had been allowed to go to a lawsuit, and the people who we think of as the responsible parties, you know, we all have a, an idea of who that might be, they would have been out of, out of business. Uh, no question about it. It's hailed as is an effective way to get relief to the victims to to keep the companies going so that they can employ people and so forth and most importantly to minimize the amount of legal time. Think of what would have happened with a hundred parties with all the different lawsuits. Think how long it would have taken. I mean it would have been seven years, ten years, fifteen years before all of this stuff had got, got settled. So I, I would ask you to think about this. Think about if it impacts uh, your brain as being fair, not fair, a good way to do things, not a good way to do things. Um, and uh, our final panel will uh, address this. We'll see what the lawyers and the insurance people think. Um, Michael's going to talk about a project that uh, that failed and didn't kill anybody. And uh, okay. well, I think George just invited Stephen. I participate here because you know, just needed two more to round it out and make it a magic twenty or something like that. So uh, I've only got one building to talk about, and <clears throat> this one is this is like when is a failure not when is a catastrophe not a catastrophe, right? It is this is this is an economic failure with a physical structural proportion to it. Uh, and as someone called it, it resulted in temporarily the most expensive billboard. Um, the Harmon Hotel. So for those of you who are not familiar with Las Vegas, uh, the city center project uh, is a massive development. Uh, it is many millions of square feet on 76 acres, the largest privately funded development in US history. Um, it started off about $4 billion of budget to be a completely, you know, self, sort of self-contained lifestyle center. Um, everything, you know, residences, retail, uh, entertainment, of course. There was a grocery store, the first one on the strip that was planned, although it actually hasn't happened. Um, there's even its own, quote unquote, sustainable power plant on the site. Uh, it's massive, and if that, as if that weren't enough, it connects to other MGM properties. Uh, MGM owns something like nine hotels and casinos in Vegas right now. And that's just, that's just the hotels and casinos. There are other entertainment venues that owns. Uh, and then, of course, the worldwide portfolio is um, built for 12,000 employees with um, 2,400 condos, twice as many hotel rooms. This was this was the concept, and it ballooned to nine billion dollars worth of 
this function. So this is like a drama, right? This is a, this is a very sad kind of drama uh, in three acts. And this is our cast of characters. Now, I, I've left out the many attorneys that are involved. We'll consider those extras, uh, supporting players. Um, but, but just so you, you know, kind of the names of those who are involved, uh, MGM Resorts and City Center for, for these purposes are the other. Uh, MGM Resorts owns 50% with, uh, with Dubai, or Dubai World owns City Center. And they are the owner, and they hired Adamson Associates Architects to be the executive architect for the entire City Center project and Tudor Perini to essentially be the lead contractor for the project. Um, Adamson hired the design team, which is Norman Foster and Partners, and uh, Halco Gallus, uh, which was at the time a Toronto-based, I guess still is a Toronto-based structural firm that is owned by a UK firm that got bought recently by ch 2 m Hill that got bought by Jacobs. So consider it Jacobs. <laughs> um, and Tudor Perini is, is a massive contractor uh, who is still involved with massive projects and most recently Hudson Yard. Um, Tudor Perini hired Pacific uh, Coast Steel, which is now part of something larger called Pacific Steel Group. Um, and, uh, and there's another player that comes up here, but I put him on, on a different group. Um, these supporting players are the AHJ, uh, which in this case is Clark County, Nevada. Uh, Clark County is, is big. It contains 74% of the population of the state of Nevada. Um, and it's growing massively. Um, and it is also in an active seismic area. So all of these complicating factors mean that Clark County has a lot of work to do. Clark County development, uh, the development entity has a lot of work to do to oversee all this construction. Um, they rely on uh, ICC certified special inspectors, as do lots of municipalities. In this case, Converse Consultants out of California. Uh, and Converse works nationwide um, on lots of big projects as well. All these, all these players are still around. Um, and then, of course, the other players are the Clark County District Court, which gets involved, although nobody knew at the time they started. Um, and the state of Nevada that it represents. So Act 1 is the design starts, and everybody's moving on with this $9 billion project. In, in this initial model, it's called a lifestyle hotel. And originally, the lifestyle hotel was actually about half as tall. But program ballooned, and the concept grew, and we ended up uh, with a nearly 50-story uh, hotel mm -hmm. condo concept with condos basically stacked on top of the hotel, and then some units that would, would kind of be a little bit of both. Um, the structural design, even it, it's an elliptical footprint, the structural design was uh, challenging, but, but also somewhat traditional, and it relied on big eight foot deep reinforced concrete cast in place link beams to transfer ladder loads across the structure. So, I, I have never been, you know, been personally involved with a big project like that, a required structure like that, but link beams um, have an enormous amount of reinforcing, and the reinforcing is very precisely placed. The rebars are running very tightly together, two, three inches in between these bars. Of course, you're getting to the minimum amount of coverage because they need to be at the kind of extreme top and bottom of these link beams. So it was very tricky to install and and those link beams were designed to be cast in place with the floor slab, which made it even tricky. So Pacific Coast Steel had their work cut out for it. MGM figured that they had this sewn up, and they, they implemented uh, what would be kind of, they kind of pioneered a, a scale of construction management, and auditing, and, and project delivery that is heretofore kind of unheard of. So they had armies of auditors uh, crawling all over the project and looking after 
many multiples of key performance indicators for the project. And it's become the model for which these other big projects have been delivered, like that's your other projects international. Where you're talking about projects that are spending billions of dollars and are basically creating, you know, small cities um, and have a huge impact on the local economy. And they factor in, there's some of those indicators factor in things like you know, local government and uh, what's happening, you know, with legislation and also corruption, uh, depending on you know, where, where you are, that's a bigger or a smaller concern, but it's definitely something that gets factored in. Um, incidentally, they claimed that this process saved them $100 million, which as it turned out was not that much. Um, and I could not find any information on how much the process added to the project. Construction starts and um, everything seems to be going swimmingly, as you know, anybody can tell. And it goes up, the first few floors go on up, and, and nobody notices anything wrong. At four or five, things start to get sketchy for Pacific Coast Steel. And in their later opinion, uh, there were design problems, uh, perhaps coordination issues between Foster and Halcro that made some of those rebar placements very, very difficult. Um, this, this is where we start to talk about what is proximate cause and what is root cause, because things started to go badly with the contractors on site, and they started to make some decisions without any, any other approvals. Um, so they started to figure, well, we can't really fit all this rebar in, so we're not really going to put it all in. And sometimes it was so tight that they, they could get it in, but it, they couldn't make it sort of small enough to fit in the concrete. So to prevent it from sticking out, they would cut, they cut many stirrups uh, and, and rod caps and things like that. Um, and all of this was getting covered with concrete as things proceeded. Um, now you've got eyes on this project. So as all projects are, this is a team sport. And, and this is where you start to talk about what's, what, what part of this failure is attributable to one thing. The, the bad workmanship certainly is approximate cause. I think you could also argue that the bad oversight was perhaps the approximate cause because there's gonna be, there's gonna be problems. I mean, the, the, the system is designed to be tolerant mistakes, right, and some shoddy workmanship, because we have oversight built into the system. The oversight is not a, a luxury. The oversight is a responsibility of multiple parties, uh, you know, some of which are independent so that, uh, you know, they can, they can speak on behalf of the owner without bias. However, both the structural engineer and the third-party special inspector and, to a degree, Clark County failed in their regard. So as things progressed, of course, 5 through 20, um, these problems got, got overlooked, uh, literally buried in concrete in some cases, and in the case of Converse consultants, uh, seen but not noticed, or perhaps noticed but not noted. And, uh, and the reports that Converse filed regularly with the county and the other uh, did not reflect the actual conditions. Halcro, the structural engineer, was of course on site, but didn't flag anything, perhaps because a lot of it was concealed. But eventually they did get, uh, they did notice something. <laughs> and in July of 2008, Halcro engineer is the one who breaks everything to light. And the structural engineer reports that there's a problem on the 26th floor, uh, and then on subsequent floors, once they start looking, that um, this rebar has been placed incorrectly. The county issues a notice of violation, and uh, the closer they look, the more they find, and they know inconsistencies in placement uh, floor to floor, which means they, they made mistakes on one floor, and they made a different mistake on the next floor. And uh, there was no real explanation found for why the incorrect approach wasn't even consistent. Uh, it just seemed to be sloppy uh, in these link beams going all the way up. Um, and all that leads to some, some 
interesting consequences because, as we've said, this one did not result in any deaths. The building was not occupied for its intended purpose. Um, they stopped at that 20, depending on how you count, 27th, 28th floor, um, and didn't proceed with the construction. It was determined that the building uh, had structural deficiencies that would impair it in the seismic event, but it was not going to fall just on its own in normal circumstances. So nobody died. Were laws broken? It was a little, a little complicated. Certainly policies were broken. Um, and Clark County Development took some of these, these folks to task, as did the Nevada State Contractors Board. And they imposed their own judgments and fines, which, uh, given the, the kind of nature of things, uh, may seem a little light, but of course, the real justice comes a little bit later. Um, Pacific Coast Steel paid a small fine, um, and the firm did not have to admit fault on the, to the state board. Uh, Converse Consultants was basically suspended from working in part of the state of Nevada for six months. And the inspectors that falsified the reports lost their credentials. I think there were two inspectors in question. Um, the owner, now seeing a lot of things that have happened since the project was envisioned, um, is thinking now that they're gonna they're gonna abandon finishing the project given the circumstances. And why shouldn't they? Because when the project was conceived, Las Vegas was booming and there was no end in sight. When construction started, the Great Recession happened. And all of a sudden, it seemed like Las Vegas did have uh, a maximum. And it didn't need uh, another you know, 4,000 hotel rooms, um, in addition to the other 4,000 room hotels that have been constructed in the last previous years. So the MGM, grants, uh, MGM Resorts decided to limit the project at first, um, which, of course, would save them a lot of money right up front. Um, and then, of course, they had to go about figuring out what they could do with the property as it was. They decided to cap it uh, and leave it as hotel without the upper floor commerce. But that didn't last. Um, because now everybody's in court. And um, the longer it goes, the worse the economic outcome of the project gets. And... MGM decides that it is actually in their best interest to simply demolish the project. They don't need the additional 2,000 hotel rooms that are on those lower floors. They've already built other hotels by other prime architects in city center alone. So they are now making the argument that the building shouldn't be allowed to stand, but it is dangerous. They marshal experts on their end to do reports that uh, attest to the building's uh, structural insufficiency. Meanwhile, Perini, of course, is arguing the opposite because they have hundreds of millions of dollars on the line that they have not been paid for in building that, the, the first stories that they built. And so they are arguing strenuously that the building actually can be salvaged and repaired, and they get their own engineering done that says that for $20 million, they can occupy much more safely. Uh, it goes to the state, and the state at first says, yes, you can demolish it, Argues against it and gets uh, gets some some court somewhere to, to rule that there's a problem with some of the testing that suggests that the building has a, an overarching problem, not just some localized problems. Uh, that determination goes to the state supreme court. The state supreme court agrees with the initial ruling that the building can be determined to be fundamentally unsound, so demolition can proceed whether Korea wants it to or not. Um, so that's, that's what they move forward with. The demolition cost is $11.5 million, uh, and Clark County requires the entire city center project to retest everything Congress consulting is involved in and uh, in a search that they have a final say on the results of those retests. And so the building is demolished. Um, it used to be right here in this corner of the project. It is no more. Um, it was $500 million on the line. Everybody settled for undisclosed amounts. Um, county and the courts find, find fault with both PCS and Congress Consulting. Um, and MGM uh, has a study done themselves 
that point some fingers at Halcro uh, for some of those design problems. Uh, some of those problems may be related to things that were not related to link beams, but, uh, but those deficiencies surely were used to bludgeon with, uh, in the settlement negotiations. Um, so between 2014 and 2015, the whole structure is removed a piece of time, and uh, city center operates very fine without it. And the entire thing, of course, isn't known as city center anymore. It's deep area. And so this, this sad play comes to an end, and um, everybody now has kind of looked back and made some determinations as to what could be changed, uh, why, and who really deserves to pay and why. Um, Clark County, of course, has to rely on those third party inspectors. Um, their process of, of employing monitors to spot check the work of those inspectors continues. Um, but of course, everybody takes it a little bit more seriously right now, but they have not made changes to their funding <coughs> process. Uh, they did note in their analysis that their monitors did tend to examine free bar on the foundations uh, more strenuously, rely more on those inspectors for the upper floors, which is a procedure that they are reviewing or have reviewed and make changes to. I'm not sure what those changes have been in reality. The lawsuit um, between MGM and their contractor uh, led to a couple of things that I thought were interesting. Uh, PCS, the Pacific Coast Steel, got sued, of course, by Green. And this is one of those situations where it matters. Because we're not talking about criminal things, we're talking about contractual things. It matters who works for who. Um, and it's, it's difficult to make third-party claims given the nature of these agreements. So um, it becomes, the, the big num numbers come down to MGM and Tudor Curry, PCS, uh, and then secondarily between MGM and the structural engineer through the executive architect who gets sued by them as well. Uh, PCS, because they got sued by Tudor Perini turns around and files a complaint against the structural engineer. PCS does not work with the structural engineer, of course. So they are filing, they're trying to assert professional negligence. Um, however, that's, that's a difficult standard to meet. And they instead tried doing, uh, tried asserting negligence, that they negligently misrepresented the circumstances. Um, because it, it was about the professional negligence in came down to does the fact that Halcro didn't do their inspections in a timely fashion uh, suggest that they didn't do their design work in a professional manner? Were they, in fact, professionally negligent? That turned out to be very difficult to show. So the allegation of negligent misrepresentation uh, was tried, but Ultimately, it didn't work out for, uh, for PCS. I don't think they got much of anything. Um, no, no, no. Not no. So, any questions? The concept of special inspections is fundamental to practice and construction these days. Does all of this bring that into question, or is it still? No. I've read nothing that suggests that anybody is questioning the process. And maybe that's because no lives were lost. Uh, and because even though it is a, is a monumental economic failure in the grand scheme of things, even in the, 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 the scale of city center, it was surrounding here. But there was a question related to the, the testing quality by, by PCS or I'm not sure. Converse Consultants was the third party. And, and they completely failed, of course, and they misrepresented 62 different reports. Yeah, but there's no, no questioning the, the relationship between the owner hiring the special inspectors who are essentially acting on behalf of public agency. That's not... Not that I have read. I've read nothing that suggests that any of those parties are consider, reconsidering that relationship. Maybe because nobody has a better arrangement. So I, I couldn't help it. I ran across this quote from Larry the Cable Guy. Um, we're going to talk about a very serious subject here, but to lighten things up a little bit, so we're talking about death and destruction, and we're going to talk even more about death and destruction. You know, 
Let's go to a real quote, though. Technology is there today to give early and normal war- normally ample warning when a tornado uh, is, is in, in a possibility. Okay. So what I'm here to talk to you about is Joplin, Missouri, 2011. Joplin is the fourth largest city in the state of Missouri. Uh, normal population is 49,024 people. But the daytime population brings it up to 270,000 from people coming from surrounding areas of the uh, uh, surrounding minor cities like St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Um, the area population is around 400,000 people. If you're not familiar with where Joplin is, if you take 44 south and right before you hit the Kansas border, turn north, you're in Joplin. Uh, and it's located right in the area that's currently known as Tornado Alley. Um, it's ideally situated for supercell tornadoes, uh, thunderstorms being the strongest of the strong thunderstorms roll through here frequently. And they produce tornadoes rated EF2 or higher. Is, is everyone familiar with the enhanced Vegeta scale? That's the EF rating for tornadoes. It goes from zero to five, five being the highest. So some facts for you about what happened in Joplin. On Sunday, May 22nd, around 1.40 p.m., the National Weather Service issued a tornado watch. Tornado watch, if you're not aware, is a... The, the conditions are highly favorable for a super strong thunderstorm, possible tornado. Uh, the conditions are very favorable. Well, a tornado warning was issued at 517. A sheriff's deputy saw a, a funnel cloud, so he reported it, and they, they in turn sounded the sirens at 517 and at 531. At 541, there was a tornado, the tornado touched down in Joplin. Doing the math a little bit, that's 24 minutes of prep time between the warning and when it got to the city of, of Joplin. So you had 24 minutes to seek shelter. Okay. For this tornado, it was an EF four five. That was that was at its peak, and you're going to find an EF five. They they stopped measuring winds at over 200 miles an hour. Okay. Just to give you the idea of how strong this storm was. And it wasn't just one vortex. You know, you think of a vortex as one, it was a double vortex, EF 4 or 5 tornado. It was three quarters of a mile wide in the city, but it got up to a mile wide when it got outside the city. The total path, it traveled for 22.1 miles from the city out to the, to the east. The Joplin damage path was three quarters of a mile wide and was six miles long. It, it, it uh, damaged over 30% of Joplin, and they calculated over 3 million cubic yards of debris were hauled out of that area uh, at the end of that. The wind speed in excess of 200 miles an hour. That's what they could, that's what they could calculate based on the damage that they saw. Unfortunately, 161 people died. And that's the deadliest tornado event in the United States since 1947. There were over 1,300 people injured from that tornado. So this kind of takes you through the development of the tornado. You can see, starting here, is where uh, the little letter I is where the touchdown was. You see it rapidly turned into a two. You have two, four, and five, 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 right over the heart of the city. And I went to five, four, three, two, one, and it Papered out and kind of went away. 22.1 miles long. This is the damage path through the city of, of Java. The red is the most severe area. And I'll tell you, the reason I'm so interested in this tornado, I, I don't know how many of you are aware of the Missouri Safe Coalition. Has anyone ever heard of that? Some? Okay. The State Emergency Management Agency of Missouri. Uh, had a law passed several years ago where they train architects and engineers on a volunteer basis to do structural assessment visual evaluation. That's what SAVE stands for. When you do this on the behalf of the state emergency management agency, you are held harmless from anything you do, do during that deployment under their <coughs> guidelines. So as an architect, as a licensed architect, I cannot be sued if I were to do something in good faith representing the state of Missouri. So I was down there for this, uh, doing some building inspections. And 
the red is virtual devastation. There's almost nothing. You'll see some photos. Give you an idea of what job was like before and after. There's a corner before, across the location, a corner afterwards. Nothing left. No, no limbs on trees. Trees were just, if there was a tree still standing, it was just the trunk and some major branches. This is a satellite photo before on the right hand side. And, and what I found interesting was this nice brown swath over here, which is total devastation. And what you can't tell from these photographs, and what I noticed when I got off of it, who's been up in their attic any time recently knows that notices that smell. It's sort of a musty insulation type smell. That's what the city smelled like. A giant attic. Didn't help it was 80 degrees and highly humid, but you know, that was it as well. So the damages. Thousands of structures were damaged or destroyed. <laughs> Single family housing below. 4,380 were destroyed, 3,884 were damaged. Multi-family housing, there were a lot of apartment complexes there that got damaged. Large retail got damaged, and public buildings got damaged. The most notable damage you may have heard, you probably heard on the news, St. John's Regional Medical Center. Home Depot was destroyed. There was one wall standing on the Home Depot. Walmart was destroyed. Cell phone towers, there were 50 damaged that were not functioning. And 10 of them totally destroyed. Just like kind of shows you what happens. Here's a here's a tower laying down right on the other side. Fell across an apartment building. Standing next to this one, you can tell the displacement, the telephone tower, or the, the, the electrical pole. Just got that. St. John's uh, Medical Center. It's totally unsafe. They moved 183 patients out within 90 minutes of the tornado touchdown. They had nowhere to go with them. They found, they found shelter for them. Five patients died, mainly in the ICU. The electric failure of the building. That is the main hospital in Joplin, right yeah. And one visitor who died from damaged debris about them, you know, always. Working with SSE engineers who was down there at the time. I, at the time, I worked across the street from them. And SSE was down there evaluating the hospital. They said that, it, that the hospital itself was displaced off the foundation by a few inches. That building was moved a few inches off the foundation. So this is the uh, basically the head inspector, Stephen Cope. There was a few thousand people volunteered to go down and help evaluate these buildings. And from Sunday to that Saturday, we were able to knock out all the buildings, a little over 6,000 buildings, evaluating them, you know, putting tags on buildings, if it was red, green, or yellow. Uh, red being unsafe, yellow being safe to occupy part of, green being, it's all fine. <clears throat> I just said that. <laughs> uh, of the buildings, though, 38% were deemed totally unsafe. Of that 38%, I'd have to say 25%, there was no building. It was just a foundation. 6% uh, were accessible with restrictions, and 56% were green. That's how drastic it was, from red to green. There was almost no, no in between. You can see this on this on this map here. There's almost no yellow on this one. It's either, it's either a good building or a destroyed building. We didn't qualify. We, we just evaluated them by address, and the city had what was at that address. So they just knew that it was a business or a residence, that business. This one, this was an interesting one. Um, you think this is bad, this isn't bad at all. But this house was picked up and moved off of its foundation. And the reason you can tell, if you look here, it's the front porch. The front door's over here. So the whole building was just moved off of its foundation. And you're talking about proximate and root causes. Well, we know the proximate cause, right? It's the tornado. Where? What's the root cause? Well, it looks pretty good. We've got a silk plate. We've got anchor bolts. Well, let's look a little closer. Oh, wait. Oh, where'd that course go? The entire course of masonry was just lifted up off of the adjoining course below. There was no reinforcing steel in there, nothing. The cells were not grounded solid. There's no basement in this house. It's, it's a it's a crawl space. But you can see where it was just picked up and moved. 
And, you know, upon further review, you can see where the uh, floor joists were. Right here, they were probably just end nailed to the band board, and it was just set on the foundation. They weren't tied to the sill plate. This was a great, this one was weird, okay? So this house and the one next to it, the white one you see in the background, we come upon this, remember that picture I showed you, that corner that had nothing in the foreground? Imagine that neighborhood, this house sitting right in the middle of all that. <laughs> We're looking at that corner. Why is that house still there with, you know, the garage doors were damaged, looks like the, some shingles were ripped off. But why is that house still there? So the two, two older gentlemen were on the front porch, and we walked up to them and just said, you know, we're, we're with the state of Missouri. We'd like to look a little closer at your house and see why it's still here. <laughs> I mean, that guy, you're here because they were older. They couldn't take care of themselves anyway, but they were giving water to everyone else around them. And they said, sure, no problem. Well, we walked around the building, and we discovered this. This is the back porch. See this metal strap right here? We asked them what those metal, when they put those metal straps in. That metal strap goes from the wall, past the bandboard, to the foundation, and connects it. So they've tied everything together. Their whole house was tied to the foundation, so it couldn't move. That's why that house was still there. So, as a little teaser for you guys, in February, I'm going to talk more about how this proximate and root causes, because there's no one to blame here. There's no one to blame. But what came out of this was a realization that we need to do things better and a realization that we can protect ourselves because we do have the time to get into a safe location. It's not a hurricane. Hurricane sustained winds up to 150 miles an hour, maybe a little greater, maybe less. You've just got to sustain that for a few days. A tornado is instantaneous. It's on you and it's over. It could happen multiple times in the same day. Think of that. That same year, there was multiple uh, tornadoes in uh, Edmond, Oklahoma, and a few other locations. And I'll show you some slides from Edmond, Oklahoma, too. The copings failed. They were ES1, EF, Spry. ES1 certified coatings. They're designed to withstand tornadoes. They did. They just happened to be a couple blocks away attached to the board, which was supposed to be holding them in place. So it's all about construction and making sure that we design and build these things in the right way so that people can survive these events. One thing that the, the hospital did, I was fortunate enough to be working with a company at the time that was asked to redesign the Joplin Hospital. And they said, can we make this building tornado proof? Well, we can't make anything proof. We can make it as tornado resistant as money will allow. How much do you have? <laughs> At the time, no one had designed, here you go, Joel, here's an idea for you and Steve. No one had designed, it's my knowledge, no one still has, other than one person, a tornado resistant window. Because it has to be tested to such a high degree of impact. Well, we're doing a ton of work with my hurricane. Exactly. There's a lot of hurricane radios. But hurricane is a sustained wind, not in excess of 200 miles an hour. You know, you got to fire that 2 by 4 at 200 miles an hour at five locations on a window. It's not going to survive. So what I want to talk about in February is I want to talk about with the panel FEMA 361, 320, and ICC 500. What happened in Joplin is when these buildings got rebuilt, the high school was demolished. In that high school now, they have three locations that are small shelters. And the federal government paid for them. Basically, they have no windows. They're concrete construction, floor or uh, walls and ceilings. They are, they've got tornado resistant doors, which are very heavy, very expensive doors. And they can be closed off in an emergency. And, and they will hold in place. Their gymnasium, their library, and their cafeteria. Nice. I'm not sure what the, what St. John's did down there, but we were in discussions about hardening the ICU um, and the cafeteria. Those are the only places that they could do it. Spend longer now, so. This is not an option. <laughs> a clever idea, but it is not an option. Hmm. 
And finally, uh, some tips, construct an appropriate storm shelter or this was left over. There used to be a bank in that parking lot. The vault's still there, but the bank's gone. Or this is the most this is the best advice I'll give you tonight. <laughs> On your way out of your house into your basement. Okay. This is the this is the second best option. Place some hot dogs and cheese slices in your pocket so the search dogs find them first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's it for me for now. Um, make sure you sign the uh, sign up sheet. I got it up here. If you haven't done it, you need credits. I want to thank Hank for uh, live streaming the program and uh, tell him for sponsoring our food tonight. Thank you all.